the What's Neat This Week podcast is supported by enthusiastic model railroaders just like you. Additional support is provided by Atherin Trains. Check out all the new monthly announcements at atherin.com. Additional support is also provided by Oak Hill Model Railroad Track Supply. Check them out. Their website is ohrtracksupply.com. Thank you very much, Jeff Otto, for your support. Let's see what happens here. I all think right, I remember how to do this. I've done this once before. All right, let's light it up. All right, guys. Light it up, boys. Light Somebody up. give us a countdown. All right. Okay, it's everybody up right here, right? not me. Right yeah, here. Okay. Chris Morasco. And three, two. <laughs> This is the What's Neat This Week podcast for March 10th, 2018. This is podcast number 28. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, the host of the What's Neat show over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. And this is your show. This is the moment when we all get to kick back for a few minutes, pour ourselves a hot cup of tea, and talk about model railroading, one of the best hobbies in the world. And today I've got some new news. First of all, Scaletrains.com has talked about their brand new Gunderson 5188 cubic foot covered hopper. Thank you very much James Wright for providing us with the footage of this beautiful rivet counter series freight car. I got to tell you it's a really neat looking freight car that they've come out with and I expect to have one of those where we might be able to photograph one outside but thank you again James Wright for providing us with the video of that. This week I picked up some locomotives, the first models that I've actually purchased this year and these are some Bowser Montreal Locomotive Works C636 locomotives. Uh, these are absolutely gorgeous Alco models. I saw one of these when I was in Colorado filming a layout two weeks ago, and I thought it was so beautiful that I would create some photographs and some videos for the What's Neat show with them. But this is some really nice product from Bowser, and I understand they're coming out with some red barns next, and that's the fully uh, cowl unit uh, locomotives that they ran up in Canada. So tonight we've got with us, and I should have started out this way, but of course I've got Michael Buddy, I've got Jeff Meyer and his son Connor. I've got a special guest with us tonight, Chris Morasco, who is a incredible military modeler, wrote a beautiful book for Kalmbach Publishing. We've also got Thomas Heal behind the camera, number I two. Know. Thomas Heil behind camera, number two. And of course, we got Dirk Reynolds. And look, there's, there's who's over there in the corner? Mr. Our Eagle favorite, Pat. Daniel that? Coombs. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's Daniel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Look who's here. Oh, yeah. So now I want to start off with <laughs> our special guest, Chris Morasco, am I saying it right? You are indeed. Chris, now you are an incredible modeler, and you did this book for Comblock Publishing called Building <clears throat> Dioramas, and you are what I would call a military modeler? Actually, I build everything. I started out as a kid, and uh, I did trains, and uh, car models, airplanes, uh, anything I could put a firecracker in. <laughs> hey, you know, more bang to the buck, right? Oh, boy. But uh, I progressed into military modeling and uh, sort of taking it serious over the last 35 years, and uh, this is some of my works. Now, in this book, you described airbrushes. You were telling me about this favorite airbrush that you use. I think it's like an $800 airbrush. Well, Tell I us use, about that. I use, no, I, uh, yeah. I use uh, a lot of the Tamiyas and the HGs and uh, Badgers, but the Ferrari of all airbrushes is the uh, Iwata Micron. I mean, this this thing is smooth. I mean, it's 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 the top of the line. And hmm. that's a very fine painting airbrush. Yeah, it's actually you can shoot darn near any paint through it. Um, I I prefer uh, lacquers and uh, something that you you can thin down really really well. Uh, it'll shoot inks even better. Um, acrylics, you just got to make sure that you clean your brush right afterwards because if you don't. You're going to have a solid brush to contend with. Now, in your book, you had a segment on how to, or a chapter on how to paint figures' faces. Right. And it was right. very impressive to me how you were able to get the detail of the shadowing of the cheeks and the eyebrows right. and the eye detail. I think that's this page right, right here, in I was fact. Looking at that. But is this something that we can do in HO scale with a smaller you can, figure? You can do it HO. You can do it, honestly, you can do it in uh, O scale, whatever. I mean, if you've got figures, you can do it. And, uh, with the smaller scales, it's easier because all, all you got to do then is basically put a flesh tone on, 
and take some oils like a burnt umber or maybe a little bit of burnt sienna. Do a fine wash. Uh, I'm in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Wash. We do wash. wash. That's <laughs> how I knew it. <laughs> I always wash. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> hey, I catch so much flack over you. Are you wash. kidding? It's finally fine. So, nice but anyway, to find somebody else's system. So the you can actually put a wash on the face and uh, leave it on for about a minute and wipe it off, and you'll have enough details to get by with, especially in HO. Right. It'll uh -huh. work. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go back and maybe put a little <clears throat> white here of the forehead, the cheeks, and the chin, and then dabble it in, just like stipple with mm -hmm. a flat brush, and it'll blend in and give you a highlight. Easy. I mean, it, it'll work. So, as Chris, a matter you, of fact, you mentioned I can, uh, I can cleaning show you your airbrush that. a minute ago. Right. What do you clean your airbrush with, even, even when you're using acrylics? Um, when I use acrylics, I use a lacquer thinner to clean. Okay, it. You right. Know, uh, if I'm that's kind of what I use for uh, all paints. Right. Really, if I'm clean shooting, my brush. if I'm shooting the Tamiya's, they make their own lacquer thinner. That's really mm -hmm. good. However, you know, with one small half a quart or a pint, whatever they sell it in, yeah, for twelve bucks or yeah. whatever. You can go to Wally World right, and buy a and gallon it. for the yeah, same price. Right, exactly. It does the same. You know, uh, yeah. you can use Windex. Um, the only thing bad about Windex is uh, it, it's got ammonia, and the ammonia the ammonia will at attack the, uh, the stainless. Oh, okay. And it'll eat away Don't at the that. brass underneath that also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. but lacquer thinner, just put it through there and clean yeah, it. That's and, uh, make pretty sure much you, all purpose. Yeah. Make sure you, you pull your needle out real quick, and I can give you a quick rundown how to do it. Okay. Real quick, if you want to see. Well, let's get through the rest of the show. Right, Chris, yeah. tell us about these dioramas you brought with you here. Well, what I have here is, like I said, I've always been a, a train sort of, I guess, I don't know, freak. As a, a train kid. freak? Train what freak. scale is this? I see this rail on top. This is 135th scale, and this is European, uh, you know, four foot, eight and a half inch gauge, or, or close to. Um, and basically, it's uh, four Germans, World War II, somewhere probably in... I'd have to say Yugoslavia or somewhere, and they're getting ready to blow the bridge, basically, and that's wow. the name of the vignette, the diorama. That's neat. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've got Envirotex for the uh, the water, and this was done back in 80, I mean, 96 or 97, and it's all uh, painted in enamels and oils, everything, with the exception of the uh, figures, uh, uniforms are all acrylics. Mm -hmm. And then this piece here is a World War One British armored car, and uh, it's even got a dead German there, with the skull and the <laughs> helmet. Um, this is all acrylics, and with the exception of oils, all, all the weatherings oils, um, the the mud and everything. That's nothing but uh, what is it? Ground sage. I grabbed out of the wife's uh, yeah cupboard. Yeah, yes. And um, like I said, I slammed it, and that's about two weeks time frame, and. The decals are water slide decals, mm -hmm. and underneath I use um, Future Floor Wax. Now it's called Johnson Pop right. Floor Polish. Yeah. You know, yeah, a lot and of people then, uh, use that on trains. Yeah, I've been doing too. it. I've been yeah, doing Joe it. For, uses that. I've yeah. used it for forty years now. Yeah, and then I uh, use the solva set on the decals to get the suck down mm -hmm. and the level right. flat. But the trick to the decals are, and a lot of guys don't realize this. If you flat coat over that decal once you get it down, mm -hmm. you're still going to see a lip. Yeah. So I give it a couple coats of right. future afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that takes that step of the decal out and gives it sort of that elliptical, you know, mm -hmm. the half moon, you right. know, but it's smooth. So you can weather right over it and not, no problems at all. Hmm. So. Now you're almost a professional modeler. Not yeah. only that, I want to say that you do nice custom woodwork here on your right, dioramas. On but you do yeah. this full time. You say you do clinics around the yeah, country. Yeah, I, I am a professional modeler. I okay. do full time. I, uh, I, I publish books. I, I do, I, you know, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none, you know. <laughs> I'm like Connor over there, you know. But, He's getting uh, there. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I've, I've got a buddy of mine that's, uh, if I can't do the base or have it done, he'll do them for me, and he's cheap. Yeah, you know, nice. And, and I prefer, what I prefer is this, though. If, once you, one, one of the biggest problems to base work is once you get something on there, it's permanent. So I have him build these hollow bases uh, stash box yeah that way stuff, if man. this gets yeah. damaged Listen to Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah so that way if this gets damaged i can easily pull it off cut a new piece of masonite and redo yeah. it you know for, but if or I, you if could I put any get scene to, you want on that anything yeah, be hide all your like money to say there. i can use this base yeah. down the road i know next time we whatever, go to mike's house check all know. his models for money <laughs> None of mine have bases that look like that I'll tell well you. And, and the reason <laughs> the reason uh, i use these bases is i started using these about 20 years ago and what I want to do is to have a HO, sort of a single car narrative, basically, sort of a one car vignette. And I want to have it powered mm -hmm. or have an engine on there. 
but I want to have it a little bit longer and I've got to figure out how to, you know, I, I don't know the electronics involved yet. So just to have this at a show, have the unit, have the, what do I have, Digitrax or what do I have for my power unit, the one I got from Ken, I mean, uh, up at the Mark Twain. What do you got, MRC? Uh, no, the, the good stuff. Oh, the Digitrax. Uh, yeah, Digitrax. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what you got. Yeah, so yeah. I've got to figure out how it's, I can power up something this small and be able to have the sound and everything. I'm sure it can be done. It's just, you know, I've got to con concentrate on the power source, how I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but being that if I have a facade on top, I can run everything underneath right. and down through the bottom right. to a power source, correct? Mm-hmm. So, but that's that's why I do these type of. I know you have fun with the electronics in this group. Yep. LED lights, man. You have fun. Yeah, with that. LEDs. Yep. Yeah. So, Chris, you said do you say you painted the figures with acrylics? Yeah, brush, the uh, brush paint. Yeah, yeah, they're all brush painted. What is your? Yeah. What is the best? I mean, you said you did a long time ago, but what is your favorite acrylic to brush paint with? Um, brand. Vallejo. Really? Yeah. Right. Vallejo a lot of or Reaper. About okay. that. What yeah. or, Vallejo. What? I met Vallejo the folks at or Reaper. Reaper. They're yeah, Pretty nice you know, okay. And then there's a company out of Italy that uh, does a lot of great uniform colors uh, called Life Color. I mean, okay, yeah, great I've seen stuff. Them too. But are those um, all flat, like dead flat? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah, they're they're flat. Okay. Yep. yep. And uh, like I said, I still paint figures, a um, oh, bunch, probably a couple dozen a year or more. And uh, But acrylics are the trick because they dry fast, they dry very hard, they've got a nice hard shell mm -hmm. to them. And you can still put oils on top of them. For for instance, all the faces, I do the basics in acrylics, and then I put oils on top. Gotcha. So. Boy, Chris, I'd sure like to have you on the What's Neat show, actually showing how you do stuff. No, that, that can be arranged. You know, I, I can, I, we could show what you do in a few seconds or a few minutes, very mm -hmm. short amount of time, even though it might take, you know, a few hours to film it. Right. But it would be very, very conceptual as to what you're explaining yeah. and how you do things. Well, this would be a real quick, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. We, we do seminars. I mean, I, I travel around the country, I do seminars. I, I was just down in Atlanta three weeks ago, and I presented an airbrushing seminar, and uh but there's a lot of little things you got to keep in mind too. You know, it's called basically that slice of life reality. I mean, for instance, you see these little white drops everywhere. You know what that is? Bird poop. That's right. I mean, you got to you got to consider this. Pigeon yeah. waste. Yeah, you, it's you gotta, actually there. Yeah, it's there. I mean, you got to think about stuff. Are like you going to be at the RPM in July in St. Louis? Collinsville? It, yeah, I plan okay. on being over there. All right, good. You giving a <clears throat> seminar? No, nobody's asked me. I don't know how to do it, but I wouldn't mind sitting over there for the day. Yeah. Oh, you you give yeah. a tremendous clinic. Yeah, because okay. I, I ran into a guy last year, and I took them all out you'd to eat. A guy the named Perry Lambert. Meet there, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Right. So I took right. Perry and Joe and all of us over to Steak and Shake, and we had a good time. So, yeah, I'd like to hook up with the guys again and sit yeah. there and BS right. with them all day. <sighs> That makes me smile. Hey, man, I'm full totally BS full-time, man. The smile completely reminds me that this would be a great time to speak about Mr. Smiles, and that is Jeff Otto over at Oak Hill Model Railroad Track Supply. Jeff has sent me some pictures of some new crossover jigs that he's making. He's coming out with some new products to follow up his line of hand-laid, pre-laid track segments, which makes handling your track a little easier when you can slide it around and put it in position rather than having it just mounted right on the layout as you build it. So check it out. OHR Track Supply is the website to go to. Jeff Otto, thank you very much for supporting this. And also, also Athern has shown off their new N-Scale tank train. Chris Palomares was running it on the layout out at Caboose, that wonderful train store in Lakewood, Colorado. And I've got footage of the train running around the Tehachapi Loop layout there in the store. It's really amazing to see these tank cars in N-Scale. We've got them here on the layout in HO and we thought the fidelity was amazing but N scale I mean it's just amazing what they're coming out with but thank you very much Atherin also for supporting this podcast now Joe Fugate over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine has told me that there's a lot of people that are watching the podcast that have never heard of Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine that's an online magazine that Joe Fugate has been publishing I think for about seven or eight years now yeah. he's got about 300 350 pages of content every month it's completely free it's supported by advertisers and the manufacturers that make these wonderful models that we all get to work with. But Joe wanted me to mention this on the show for the folks that watch this podcast and have never heard of Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. Check it out. It's a free online magazine. It's updated every single month with brand new material. Plus, you can look at all of the back issues. And be sure to subscribe to it so you can get special emails and special deals, what they've got going on for new videos at uh, over at Train... Is it Train Masters TV? Yeah. 
That's him. That's right, yeah. And so I just wanted to give that quick shout out to Model Road Hobbies. By the way, we got a What's Neat video too, but you guys probably already know about that because you guys are YouTube savvy. Um, what do you got going on, Mike? I saw you brought some more models here today. Uh, I got a couple more <coughs> stack pack flat cars done this week, and uh, one of them is going to be an auto rack, uh, but I'm still working on a total of 10 of these flats and all these scratch built containers. <coughs> We're going to do a segment after we get done here on uh, this whole project and for a hit, to have on, I guess, April or May, what's neat. Probably May. I see some neat cars here. Yeah, what's these going are on at another this? couple of uh, John Tyson's shrinks. These are 66 Impalas. So these are new ones you just made this week? Uh, yeah, I just, yeah, just God, you are, how do you do this so fast, Mike? Well, I got, I always got about 10 irons in the fire at least. <laughs> now, it looks like Jeff Myers brought some models tonight, too. What do you have here, this Jeff? Is, uh, this is just a factory Atheron Genesis, uh, one of their buy levels they did. And just to show you, this is actually Connor's that he got for Christmas. But, see, I mean, it's not an extreme weathering job, but just a difference. You, know, you can see the link to that. Uh, what it started as. And then, uh, <clears throat> this is just, this is still a work in progress, but it's a Katie Freight car. Monon, but one of the things I did want to mention too, and I was thinking about it, with uh, with Facebook, so many groups and stuff out there now. There's not many photos of this car, but I I joined the Monon group. Mm -hmm. I asked instantly if anybody had photos of this car. I posted a picture of the model, and within about two hours, there was a guy who said, "Here's a photo. I photographed this in '78. It wasn't the exact same series, but it was almost. Yeah. It was very similar. I think it was the standard cushioning. This has the cushion under frame. Is this a KD car? Yeah, it's uh, Katie yeah. manufacturer, but." Yeah. Like it's just just one of those things with Facebook now. There's so much information well, out there, I know. and you it's can ask great. a question. It's it's really better than forums, in my opinion. I think that's kind yeah. of why forums have died off. But you can go on Facebook, ask a question almost about anything, and someone like Daniel or Answer or even I right. mean Mike's gotten big on there too. It kind of eats into your hobby time, it but does. It, it's just nice that you can get on there and ask a question. And right. sometimes, like I said, within five minutes, somebody's <laughs> answering you, it and really boom, amazing. there's a photo that no one no one even knew existed. Right. This guy goes, hey, I think I photographed that one. Yeah. And what do you use so, for weathering on that? This is almost all. Pretty much all oil paints, all the roof. Off, right. And it's still a work in progress. You can see this side's not even done, really. But I mean, this whole side was pretty much matched to a photograph that uh, a guy, like I said, I asked for any help, and the guy posted a picture, and there I was off with yeah, it. Yeah, right. that's sweet. Yep. I know, Daniel. I wish you were on this side of the table so I could ask you what you got going on tonight. Eagle Scouts. But Daniel asked me, what have I got going on? <laughs> Daniel, what why don't we swap on, places? Dan? <laughs> I'll tell you what, Daniel. I've been cleaning the layout as you've looked around it today. There's no Daniel. more cat hair on the layout. I've vacuumed the entire layout this week, working all the way around the entire layout. I've also been fixing a lot of the broken power lines. Now, it's amazing how power lines are, in fact, models on our model railroad layout. So I've been working on fixing those. Mine are all made scratch built out of brass as per prototype measurements. I've also spent a lot of time on the log mill diorama, which I've finished just finished up the April What's Neat show over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. In that show coming up in April, Jason Quinn's going to show us how to remove models from pre-existing uh, locomotives in case we've got... Numbers. The numbers. The numbers. 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 Yeah. What did yeah. I say? Remove models? models. Remove the numbers from Remove the, the, the numbers yeah. from the locomotives, because the fact is manufacturers only make so many locomotives right. in a series, and but of course, um, got Jason's got like 12. Too, yeah. So he shows us how to do that. We also look at John Parker's gorgeous BNSF well, Fall yeah. River Division layout. This is one of the most amazing layouts I've ever seen. Kevin Rubel gives us the rundown on what is CAD rail, something for designing and drawing our layouts. I've always been a pencil and paper guy, but Kevin shows us why CAD rail is better. We also discuss the right type of glues for attaching the screens to our locomotives, the right types and the wrong types. Stephen M. Conroy gives us some gorgeous drone footage. And for layout construction, of course, I'm doing the BTS log mill project update, which I've been working on for four solid days this week, building nothing but models 10, 15 hours a day. It's been kind of enjoyable to get that done, along with a lot of the videos for Caboose, that wonderful train store out in Lakewood, Colorado. I've been trying to get all of the Passion for Trains videos done for them. But you will see on the table here that I've got this track cleaning car. You painted and it. This is the Korea Brass model track cleaning car, and this is not how it comes. Yeah, what I did this yellow, week right? was, well, last week you saw me paint the roof black on it, mm -hmm. and now what I've done to it is I've masked the model off with some of this green masking tape, which wasn't the fine line tape that I'm used to using. So after I sprayed the model blue with this beautiful sparkle paint that looks like that stuff that Athern used on their Florida East Coast locomotives. Yeah, metallic. I love that metallic blue. I thought it would go really good with the yellow that the, the uh, 
uh, track cleaning car was already painted. But the problem was when I pulled the tape off, this wasn't tape I'm used to using, and I had an excessive amount of bleed. It was almost uh, embarrassing how much bleed that I had on running onto the yellow of the yeah. blue. But that brings me to this segment of video where you learn a tip, and this is the tip of the show, and this is an old trick that I learned from Jim Napoli when he used to paint for Overland Models a long time ago. And that is, if your paint's already cured on the model, and you put another paint on top of it and it's not cured yet, you can still remove it with just a little bit of lighter fluid. And that's what I ended up doing on the track cleaning car. I spent an hour taking paintbrushes, a quarter inch paintbrush and a very fine line paintbrush, dipping it in the lighter fluid, blotting it on a paper towel, and then working back and forth to remove the blue from the yellow areas, but yet still create a crisp, clean line. Hmm. I have painted Santa Fe blue and yellow uh, yellow bonnets uh, on hood units that way, where you can literally airbrush the curve and then clean it up with this method of using lighter fluid. It really works. It saved this project. And now this thing has a whole new look to it. Uh, you, you can't buy it this way. You still get it yellow and green from Korea Brass. But I'm just, again, having a little bit of fun with a neat model. And it was kind of neat to do that. So I'm, I'm pretty much done with that segment. Do you want to do readers' questions, Dirk? Yes, I think we can. I just want to remind everybody that we get a ton of these, and we've only got about five minutes or so to do stuff like this. So we try to. We pull do this show. What we'll do is a live show eventually where we'll be able to yeah, get through all be, of the yeah, questions. Really good. And people want to know ahead of time when we're going to do that. Too. We haven't we done can, that yet. Yeah. We need to let people. Uh, know we're going to start with uh, Jim so McCann, and uh, he asked this a long time ago. It's about uh, segment on curve easements and super elevation, and Daniel let us know that this was the uh, the helix one and the power went out one, and I think it's episode nine. Okay, so you want to look at that, and that may answer all your questions about that. Um, Ken. The tools you use for carving your foam scenery. In particular, uh, there is one item that looks like a rasp, rasp. but it's bent or curved like in a circle. Power. Yes. What's that called? Just so you guys know, I never know what these questions are until he asks me. Yeah. Um, that's a bent horse rasp. I picked it up at the Woodcraft store, and you could probably take and heat, super heat up a, a, a rasp and do it yourself if you felt yeah. like it. But you can We're buy them for nineteen ninety five. Right. I think is what they are. Go to Amazon, Google it. It's a horse rasp. It's bent. Man, it's a very bent. valuable tool for carving foam. What's next, Dirk? That was from Rick. I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. Sconefelder. I'm hoping that's right. Um, Fressburger. I uh, found three different non-animated wigwag signal kits by Wiseman Model Services in O scale. We got a lot of people asking for O scale, and look at that. We are working on that. Okay, um, this one is the best wigwag models I have found anywhere, hands down. The only problem is that they're not animated, or they're lit. Any ideas for animating and lighting one of these, or do you know of anyone who's built a realistic working wigwag in any scale? Say something. Uh, well, uh, L -L 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 LEDs for lighting would definitely be the way to go. Yeah. Um, and it all depends if it's made out of brass or plastic. Because I'm sure, you know, you can look into getting like little uh, gears and stuff like that, metal gears and stuff like that. Because, you know, all of our scale models have small little gears and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be that difficult to put a little gear system in there. It's just a matter of figuring out what works best and I'm not sure if any of our other followers have have tried playing with that or not but I'm sure that's something more than reasonable to come up with it's an o, is that O scale he said yeah uh, so he's got he's got yes yeah, so, okay so he's got even a little bit more room to than you know I normally work with HO so he's got even a little more room to play playing his housing there to make something work what else you got Dirk oh uh, this is from Russ Ratzman modern skyscrapers um, in HO scale, modern freeways, overpasses, ramps on and off. Anybody make those? I think Rick's makes. They make some of those overpasses they make an in concrete. Pass. They make, uh, yeah, they yeah. make an overpass. Like those four concrete high yeah. beams underneath. Yeah. Oh, skyscrapers! Yeah. We did skyscrapers yeah. for the 1997. Yeah, yeah. Walters cover. 98. I don't remember what year it was. It was. Walters cover. We did a three or three page fold out cover. Mike, you were there for that. Mm -hmm. Now those tallest skyscrapers were laser cut 
John Heitzman did those. The smaller buildings was a combination of design preservation and cl city classic buildings all glued together like it took 20 buildings to make one structure, Man. 20 kits. But that was a rather interesting cover shot that we Didn't did from Walker's way plexiglass back then. Didn't you make some too? That's what Heitzman's, John Heitzman at American Model Builders made those buildings out of plexiglass. Okay. Great medium for building out of, very yeah. permanent structure <laughs> material. But yeah, there's 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 a few companies. I mean, in N scale, I've seen skyscrapers. But if you really want a skyscraper, you got to scratch build it, which wouldn't be too hard. Yeah, I've use, done it use your imagination. I did it with plexiglass and foam board, and I don't know where that article was. That was in a model railroad or something somewhere. Okay, this one's from David Muse. This is for Ken. Now your modules, you know, they've all seen these things go outside. He's wanting to know. Do you have any weather problems, and are there any downsides to taking these things outside, and what happens to them? I know you use Woodland Scenics glue, mm -hmm. and was amazing because we were watching one segment, and he took the thing out, and I'm filming this, and he gets the garden hose and just starts spraying these things off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else, their stuff would just fly uh, everywhere. Yeah. Okay, and this stuff stuck. I don't really so, have problems with the sun. The dioramas get up to 140 the something wind, degrees. I think is your biggest enemy the wind now. is truly the biggest problem. Yeah. I mean, even clouds now, we can shoot in clouds and get great shots out of them. Um, wind, like Mike said, is the biggest thing. Heat, 140 degrees, cold weather, doesn't really affect too much. So far, so good. Knock on wood, it all works. And I just want to say thank you to all the folks that have come tonight. Daniel, Thomas, Chris, Mike, um, Jeff, Connor, Dirk, really Ken Patterson Chris. saying that this is March 10th, 2018. <laughs> what's Neat This Week podcast, keeping you current on what's going on in the hobby and what we've been working on. It's kind of fun to do this every week when we enjoy everybody asking questions and coming by. And, you know, we've had people just come by the back door right before the show. Everybody's welcome. So like, yeah. dislike, <laughs> uh, leave your readers questions and comments. And next week we might have Chris Palomares here. I look forward to that to see what happens. So that ends this podcast number. 28 guys let's go run some trains huh? all right all right